Hare Krishna, Garud Prabhu. Welcome back. Hare Thank Krishna. you so much for joining once again. My pleasure, Chaitanya Charanji. So, Prabhu, I was thinking today we could discuss on uh, the theme of how the Bhagavad Gita is similar to and different from other texts, other sacred texts. Because often the Gita is, at least in the Western academic scholars, sometimes Gita is called as the Bible of India or the Bible of Hinduism. And in some ways it is similar that in the court, Hindus put their hand on the Bible, on the Bible or the Quran or the Gita. So there are some ways in which it is similar, uh, at least in terms of the conventional, contemporary perspective of how it is looked at legally or academically. But there are significant differences. One of them you have mentioned in your earlier podcast also how the starting point of the Gita is very different. It doesn't start with God, it starts with the human condition. Okay. And I also felt a couple of things is that the content and the mood, it seems if you consider or compare the Bible, the Gita seems more similar to something like the works of Plato and Socrates uh, rather than the theological texts of the Bible. Yeah. Hmm? And yeah. so in terms of content, it's more philosophical. And uh, also in terms of mood, it is not so much calling for belief as it is calling more for inquiry and introspection. So, so that those are some of my broad thoughts. But you could, you could this you could start the way you would like. Yes. Well, you've covered some very uh, um, primary contrasts there, and uh, it's interesting how you related the Gita to the Socratic dialogues. Uh, where, you know, really, there's uh, Socrates and his students. Uh, and here we have Krishna and, and, and his student, although the relationship between Krishna and Arjuna is multi-layered. Mm. So, that's, so that's where it, it, it diverges from even the Socratic dialogues. It's very clear Socrates is the teacher, you know the, the 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 his students are only students, whereas Krishna is not only the teacher to Arjuna, but he is the very object of his own teachings. Mm, okay, both are significant differences. <laughs> that's yes. that's right, exactly. And Arjuna starts off as a warrior, with Krishna as a charioteer. Mm. That's the first half of the first chapter. The second half of the first chapter is Arjuna becomes a a a, a friend uh, who is, you know, just dumping the contents of his troubled heart mm. onto his confidant, Krishna, who's a confidant. So that's the second layer of a relationship. The third layer of the relationship is as a student to a teacher, especially in the beginning of the second chapter, verse 7, you know, shishyas te ham shadimam aham prapanam, right? Okay, you so know. just a minute, sorry. First is, yeah. you could say, warrior charioteer. Second is, right. you could say, friend, friend, or like, how we would call it that? You had mentioned dumping the content of his Friend to a confidant. confidant. Confidant, okay. And then the third is student to a teacher. Okay. Right? That's nice. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Yes, and then the fourth one is as between a disciple and divinity. I'm sorry, devotee and devotee divinity, and, devotee. Oh, okay. and that really doesn't begin until Krishna really announces his divinity uh, in some full sense, and that would begin in the fourth chapter. Yes. So you've got these four layers of relationships. Mm. And even in the fourth mm. chapter, just to continue, this is very striking. I'm yeah. out of it. So that yeah. even in the fourth chapter, Krishna announces divinity, but he doesn't elaborate on it, except of there were 10 verses, which are more or less like 4, 5 to 15, which are more That's or right. less the response to his question in 4, 4, Arjuna's question. That's right. Yeah. But actually, in one sense, Krishna's focus on his divinity begins from the seventh chapter. And Yes. Well, well, I would say that he gradually discloses more and more of his identity of divinity, 
throughout the rest of the Gita, you know, in interspersed ways. And of course, the set, the eleventh chapter in a most dramatic way, the Virata Rupa, and so on. But so we have those four kind of you could say external relationships. But then there are four relationships within his divine uh, setting. So in other words, so you've got the first four that we talked about, but then within divinity, you've got really the um, the karma yogi. You know, okay. Arjuna is being taught how to be a karma yogi, mm. what it means to act in relation to the divine. And that aspect of divinity is the virata rupa, that it's Krishna everywhere around us. And when we perceive Krishna everywhere around us, we act in a way that unites us with the divine. Okay. So that's the virata rupa. Then, that's of course, comes... A, I never yeah. thought of the correlation that between karma yoga and virata rupa. Actually, later on the 18th chapter, the 1846, when Krishna talks about worshipping him through your work, Swakarmanatam Abhyarcha, there, there he, he talks about his all pervasion. Yetaha pravrittir bhutana miena sarvamidam tatam. That from Beautiful. everything is emanated and by whom everything is pervaded. There That's we go. The universal form. Beautiful. And, and of course, as you know, the 18th chapter summarizes the rest of the Gita. So that, that's a distillation of what we're talking about now. Excellent. So, so just a real quick, so like sometimes uh, this difference between Karma Yoga and Bhakti Yoga is explained in different ways. So one way I have heard and uh, is that the Karma Yogis don't necessarily have a clear conception of divinity. And their focus may be more on detachment from the world than attainment of a particular spiritual conception. So how do you differentiate between, say, Karma Yoga and Bhakti Yoga? Uh, what are the primary differentiating points? Yeah. Um, well, you see, in a sense, I think that the Gita uh, really is speaking about... Um, Despite the fact that, you know, we have this kind of uh, major sweeping tripartite division of the Gita. The first six chapters are about karma yoga. The second six chapters are about bhakti yoga. And the third six chapters are about jnana yoga. Um, I don't subscribe to that because it's too, it's too reductive. There are themes of all three woven in each section. Mm, interesting. Yeah. You know, there's a weave, it's a weave, it's a weave, Chaitanya Charanji. It's a weave, it's a it's a tapestry of karma jnana, yoga, and bhakti. It's it's too difficult to to just make those three major sweeps. Mm, true, makes sense. Actually, and the reason and you know why that is? Why it's a weave. It's because a human being, every human being, acts, is interactive, is cognitive, and is affective. Yes, true. So rather than thinking of these as yoga, if we think of them as basically uh, faculties of a conscious being, then naturally they will be there everywhere. Okay, so so uh, every human being has these faculties, the, the, these uh, attributes, I should say, these attributes of the interactive, the cognitive, and the affective, and you can even throw in there the contemplative. But the point is this: that when they are, when we are acting to know Krishna, or in acting in relation to Krishna, or we're acting to serve Krishna, then that is a yoga then these attributes become elevated to such a state that mm. it, it connects us with Krishna. And that's what makes it a yoga. Okay. Every, every human being is interactive, cognitive, and effective. We're each acting, thinking, and feeling creatures. Okay. No one can yeah. deny this. Yes, the is question true. is whether our feelings are in relation to Krishna, whether our thinking is in relation to Krishna, and whether our acting 
is in relation to Krishna. Okay. So, in one sense, you are like taking it as a given that the object of yoga is Krishna. So, he is the ultimate object. But we could say that before Krishna's self-revelation, in the fourth chapter, in the sixth chapter, uh, yogis can have different objects for their yogic practice also. It could be Ashtanga Yoga. But we yes. could say, I remember in our discussion on yoga, you mentioned that it's like a increasing embrace where we yes. the embrace goes deeper and deeper into our heart at one level, into our being. Yes. Uh, from the interactive cognitive to the affective level, then outward in, or uh, upward it goes higher and higher to embrace higher conceptions of divinity. Yes. To put to put it simply, there is Krishna all around us. That is the Virataru. There's Krishna without. That is Brahman. There's Krishna within, that is Paramatman. And there's Krishna right in front of us, just as Arjuna experienced Krishna. And that is Bhagavan. That's beautiful. So how are you differentiating Krishna all around and Krishna without? Without means you're talking more of the substratum of existence? Or like... The complete whole. The complete whole. Okay. Where Krishna all around us is what we what we can see. I mean, look at all of the famous "I am" declarations in the Gita, in chapter seven, and chapter nine, and chapter ten. This is Krishna piercing through the phenomenal world, aspects of the phenomenal world, um, becoming uh, little superlatives in comparative relation to the supreme superlatives. So. You know, mm -hmm. of luminaries, I am the moon and I am the sun. Well, yeah. Krishna outshines any sun anywhere yes. in any universe. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. but, but you see, but he's showing us through the superlatives of what we have around us. Mm. Okay, so, so you are saying that that 10th chapter, that I am declarations, they are manifestations of the Brahman penetrating through the material coverings. There it is. Okay. Nice. So, and that's interesting because I have been pondering the connection between the 11th and the 12th chapters. Because 11th is the universal form and 12th is the question about Brahman and Bhagavan, impersonal and personal. Right. So, one right. of the ways I thought conceived of the connection is that uh, Krishna, Arjuna has understood that the materially all pervasive, because universal form is, because the materially all pervasive form of the Lord or manifestation of the Lord is subordinate to the personal, hmm? yes. personal manifestation. Because Krishna says that this is this is the two-handed form is the source of all, all of everything. Then, then the next in the twelfth chapter is asking, okay, what about your spiritually all pervasive manifestation? So, how is that related with your personal manifestation? And Krishna says that those who worship the personal are more intimately united with me. So, in one sense, you yes. could say that the. So, so Krishna all around is more of Krishna manifested in or through matter as a universal form. Whereas right. when you're saying Krishna without, what you're saying is that it is specific manifestations which we through which we can get a glimpse of Krishna's beauty and glory. So yeah. that which is that which is invisible, and so the we could say once the Virat Rupa is the visible, just like the body is visible. The Virat right. is the visible manifestation. The Atma is invisible. So yes. similarly, the Brahman and you could say the Paramatma is also invisible. But you yeah. are talking about Brahman as more outward and Paramatma as inward. Right. Mm -hmm. But let, let me let me modify slightly, although I like exactly what you said. Yes, please. It's only invisible to us at a certain point. It becomes visible. Mm. The, the Brahman becomes visible. The Paramatman becomes visible as we become and attain a more elevated state. And it's okay. beautiful. All these, all these dimensions, these layers of the divine are absolutely beautiful. Mm. And remember the Vrajagopikas in Krishna's absence, when Krishna disappears from them, what do they resort to? 
Krishna everywhere around them, the trees, even the little vines. They start talking to aspects of creation. So they're talking to Krishna to find more of Krishna. Mm, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we so have... are talking to Krishna. Yeah, and, and then in the in the in the Gopi Gita, the famous middle chapter, the Rasa Panchajayi, they're invoke they're acknowledging that, that Krishna is worshipped by all the sages, and they all long for his lotus feet. And they understand that that the that the manifestation of all existences come from him. These are things that they could care less about when they're in his presence. Mm -hmm. But they resort to that in his absence. So contemplate, for the bhakta to contemplate the virata rupa, the brahman, the paramatman is an expression of viraha, feeling alone and far away from one's beloved. That's, uh, in one sense we say bhakti yoga has this principle of yukta vairagya. So everything can be used in the service of the Lord. So, Absolutely. So, say in the second. Absolutely. Canto, so, in the second canto, when med, in the of the Bhagavatam, when the meditation on the universal form is talked about, at that time there may not be so much clarity about the personal manifestation. So that is something which is a progression toward the personal manifestation. But that yeah. same um, same tool we could say can be used by devotees. Who know about Krishna, but they can use they can use that tool to remember Krishna in his absence. That's so, right. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, if we consider that way, that there are many correlations between what is what comes in the beginning of the Bhagavatam and what comes in the in the in the Gopi Gita also, in that, which is like the culmination in the, in the pinnacle in the pinnacle yes. of Gita, the highest summit, the Ekagra. Yes. So can we say, uh, say that? This like a multi-level conception of divinity is yes. is quite distinct to the Gita as compared to other sacred books. Yes, yes. yes. So, and, and then the very fact, I mean, let's go back to originally what we were talking about, which is that the relationship between, you know, Socrates and his students is pretty flat. You know, I mean, you know, okay. there's teacher and student. And not to, not to um, be disrespectful of that at all. These are profound dialogues. The Socratic dialogues are profound. I even have a doctoral a student um, uh, that I'm mentoring uh, who's comparing um, uh, some of the uh, Greek philosophy of Socrates uh, and Platonic philosophy to, um, to Rasa philosophy. So, I mean, there are some interesting, interesting correlations, but uh, we'll have to wait on that when he publishes or when he produces his dissertation. But but here's the point. The point is that there are eight layers of the relationship between Arjuna and Krishna. Four as divinity and four as um, non-divinity uh, kind of identifications, as, as a charioteer, as a friend, and confidant, a confidant as a teacher, and then finally as divinity. But within divinity, there are four further layers. So this is a very rich, you know, rich tapestry of relationship. It's amazing. And uh, it's, a, it's about rasa. It's about rasa. And, and rasa is very thickly layered with rich nuances. Yeah. Just like a finely cut jewel. It's, it's beautiful. So the, can you just... Uh... So are these four layers of divinity, are they connected with the four yogas also? You said Virat Rupa is connected with Karma Yoga. Yes. So, so Brahman will be connected with uh, Gyan Yoga and Paramatma with Gyan Yoga? Uh, Paramatma, uh, uh, it could be uh, uh, Gyana Yoga, or you could then do, you know, uh, Ashtanga Yoga, possibly. You know, again, these are not strict categories, but course, you could yeah. say, you know, you know, Jnana Yoga for Brahman, Jnana Yoga for Paramatman, but Jnana Yoga, uh, I mean, uh, but Paramatman can be also for, for the uh, Bhakti Yogi, Bhakti Yogi, 
a bhakti yes. yogi because because the bhakti yogi sees Krishna in the heart. It's not just the Vishnu form anymore. Mm. He or she sees the well, ultimately sees Ratan Krishna in the heart and and embraces yeah. Krishna within the heart. I mean, look in the Gopi Gita. The gopis say, what a shame that Brahma should create eyelids. Yes. To block the vision of Krishna for a nanosecond, right? But the next chapter, when Krishna is with all the gopis, there's one gopi who closes her eyes. She makes use of Brahma's wacky creation of eyelids and closes her eyes. Why? because she wanted to be alone with Krishna. She didn't want to share Krishna with all the other gopis. So the way she could do that is embracing him within. Oh, so by embracing him internally, yes. through her vision, through her contempl yes. contemplation. That's right. Oh, okay. That's how she gets away from the other gopis. Oh, okay. So, so you're talking this, this close, closing one's eyes could be more of if we consider Brahman as within his Paramatma, but or the divinity within his Paramatma. But in this yes. case, for her, the divinity within whom she is embracing is Krishna. Yes. Okay. And uh, so this is, uh, so this four plus four, or you could say four, <laughs> yeah. uh, that's, that's fascinating. Maybe yeah. we, could develop, we could develop this more since this is, so in, is it that in the, in the flavor of the relationship between Krishna and Arjuna, like we say it's primarily Sakharas. So Sakharas would be more now Sakharas, of course, we could say at one level it is in, in Bhakti, they are friends. Mm -hmm. They are always friends. So, but uh, so the confidant could also be the Bhakti Yoga relationship of friendship, where is the intimate yes. friend. Yes. And within that, Krishna takes the role of a charioteer, Krishna takes the role of a teacher. And but from, from the Gita's narrative perspective, it is that the, there's a there's a progression. So Krishna is the charioteer, then he becomes a confidant. But uh, yes. you know, confidant is a very nice word, also. It's it is yeah. I think it is it a good translation of the word surud in well Yes, and, yes. So I think good. it is. It's a very feasible translation. Surat, I mean, sweetly loved, um, sweetly, um, uh, there's a tenderness there, you know, uh, and intimacy there. So Surat, yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Yes. Yeah. So now... But you see, but you see, but you see uh, Chaitanya Charanji, when we talk about the, the rasas, and I know that we're very categorically oriented, especially those of us in the West. I think the Indian mind is more flexible and fluid than the Western mind, which tends to be black and white. But really, love knows no bounds in the divine world. So when we speak of the different rasas, Let's not box Arjuna into, you know, some strict category of Sakya Rasa. This, you know, at a certain point, all five Rasas are divine. <coughs> They're all divine, intimately connecting with the divine. Now, sometimes the Goswamis sort of drop the first rasa, the, the shanta bhava, you know, the, the shanta bhava, because there isn't a reciprocation there. Mm. Whereas the reciprocation begins with the dasya rasa, right? So really, we might be talking more about the, the, uh, the, the, the four upper rasas, but you know what's marvelous, and we've just gotten through with um, Govardhan Lila uh, uh, celebration, Govardhan Lila Mahotsava. Um, and, you know, when Krishna lifts that hill, right, he lifts that hill uh, with his hand. 
he is sheltering all of the Russes. He's sheltering all of his beloveds. He's loving all of his beloveds. So that love is, is absolute and perfect, and it embraces however we embrace him. So in one sense, they're one. In one sense, they're one. But in another sense, they're finely nuanced. But love is boundless in the divine world. Whereas in this world, love has boundaries. When I am a father, I have certain boundaries. Um, even though my son is fully grown, and yeah, we're friends, you know, but he'll always be my son, you know. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, my my daughter, same thing. You know, she she's a full grown woman. She's my daughter, but she's you know again, she's my daughter. She's she's not someone I can really relate to in any other way. If I do, then that becomes perverse. Um, if if um, I have a uh, a friend uh, who is just a friend or a dear friend, that can't really change, or I can't treat that friend as something else, um, uh, like a master, you know, like a boss or a master. Um, that breaks down the relationship. With mm. Krishna, the relationship never breaks down because he totally reciprocates with the way our hearts naturally offer themselves to him. Okay. So it's a boundless love. It's a boundless love. <coughs> Excuse me. Here there are boundaries. There are ethical boundaries. In fact, in my book, my original book, I have a chapter called Ethical Boundaries and Boundless Love. Yes, this is in the Raslila book, you know how... <laughs> That's how, right, exactly. Krishna, how he, in one sense, he respects the ethical boundaries by manifesting uh, the sort of duplicate forms of the gopis. So, That's right. But at the same time... So he's, being, he's being very dharmic then. Yeah, dharmic, yes. But then there's paro dharma. Yes, that's true. So, so you are correlating this with my point that that you know Arjuna's relationships are evolving. But yes, you said that that let's not reduce him to one. But is but then if can we say Arjuna is going to relate with Krishna in the Madhurya bhav? If we say Madhurya as intimacy, then that is definitely there. But Madhurya as conjugal or amorous, then that it seems inappropriate there. Correct. Correct. And of course, it's natural for Arjuna to offer his heart as a friend, but he recognizes at the end of the 11th chapter, please leave this Virata Rupa. This is, I, 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 I'm overwhelmed, basically. Mm. I'm overwhelmed. So please, as a, a lover with a beloved, as a father to a, a son, as a friend to a friend, please come back to that more intimate exchange. You see, so it's acknowledged there. Okay. So, you see, it's acknowledged there. Yes. So, so the intimacy is, is uh, a prominent flavor of that relationship. And does the word intimacy usually have a like a sexual connotation or not always? It depends on... Not always. Person. Not always. One can be intimate friends with someone. Um, um, intimacy means closeness, you know, closeness. Um, he is a very close friend with such and such a person. And this means that they really are so uh, beloved to one another. Um, and they, um, uh, you know, uh, I, have, I have friends that I'm more formal with, and then I have friends uh, that I give a big hug to. Mm. You know? So they'll be my like closer friends. Yes. Okay. So it's it's a it's it's about closeness. And each of the Russas 
have the capacity for greater closeness or greater formality relative to the particular rasa. As we know with the uh, Sringara rasa, the Lakshmis, they have more of a formal relationship with Krishna. The queens mm. of Dwaraka, they have a more formal, but the gopis, they don't know what formal is. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely, but don't know what formal is. <laughs> they don't know what formal is. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a, in the Gopiji, there is this tension. The Gopis sometimes refer to Krishna by his divine epithet, but in the same verse, they will talk about you are all pervading, but you are our friend. So, <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> so they just right. they can't help themselves. It's that's almost, right. They know that. He, he's, they know his greatness, but the focus goes on his sweetness. That's right. You see, um, the, 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 the Aishwarya is invoked when Krishna is absent. When Krishna is present, the Aishwarya is forgotten. Okay, yes. That's, that's a... So in one sense, for us, uh, when we are separated from Krishna, uh, we are... So Aishwarya is important for us. But as we move forward, then we could say that the Bhaktivinoda Thakur, in his philosophical writings, he is quite, he's talking about the Aishwarya aspect of the Lord. But then in his songs, where he's personally calling out to the Lord, it's very much of a personal communion over there. Yes. So something similar. Yes. That's now, right. That's right. Is there some nomenclature also, which could be, like Aishwarya is contrasted with Madhurya. Where it yes. is more of opulence and uh, closeness, intimacy. That's right. But then Madhurya right. is also used for one particular relationship. So we could say even the Vatsalya, Sakya, and and the Madhurya. They all can have Madhurya within it. Yes, so, in a sense. That's uh, right. So, 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 sorry. You use the word yeah. Shringara. So is Shringara your usage of, means is that what you prefer instead of Madhurya for the conjugal relationship? Okay, so Shingara can only be the fifth rasa, whereas okay. Madhurya can be more of a generic term, as Aishwarya is more of a generic term. So Madhurya can be uh, more; it can be specifically applied to the Shingara rasa, or it can refer to generally the intimate exchanges between a devotee and and divinity. Yeah, mm. the five the five rasas, for example. Yes. So, uh, so Madhurya is, 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 is a more generic term, but Shringara is not a generic term. Shringara can only be that which goes, uh, that, well, that which supersedes Vatsalya Rasa. And uh, in, in the Gita's case, can we say that these four conceptions of divinity, what you mentioned, they are there throughout the Gita, but as Krishna, as the Gita moves towards its climax, Arjuna's focus goes more and more on the fourth. So yes. the rasa becomes more related with Madhuri or with intimacy. Yes, exactly, exactly. In fact, you know, even Krishna, Krishna, you know, will even talk about his divine forms in the third person. You know, yeah, that was the exact question I was going to ask you right now. So, so <laughs> yeah. in one sense, when Krishna is uh, he separates himself from that because he wants intimacy. He wants he wants closeness. Mm. So for those, so for example, and I, I read an article about this and studied this also. It seems that when Krishna is talking about karma yoga or jnana, uh, or that is the context. Quite often, when those seekers may not be aware of the identity of divinity. Krishna refers to himself in the third person. But yes. then when Krishna is talking about bhaktas who are aware, then immediately he shifts to the first person. So yeah. uh, sometimes it is quite striking because just a couple of like 1862, Krishna is referring to himself in the second person is saying, Sarandar Tameva Sharanam Gacha Sarva Bhavena Bharat. That's right. There and we 1866, go. 1866, he shifts to, I think from 1863 itself, he shifts to the first person. But it is That's right. uses the same theme of surrender, Ma Mekam Sharanam Raja. Hmm? That's right. So the same word also is used, Sharanam. 
So in that's one right. sense, that's like, if I understand it right, that from 1849 onwards, there's like a progression through karma yoga, through jnana yoga to bhakti yoga. So it, yes, so yeah, absolutely. So it, and in fact, I've I've you know characterized these with Krishna's terminology, which is the great secret, the greater secret, as you know this, and yeah. greatest secret of all. The first 49 verses are the great secret. The next 14 verses are the greater secret, which comprise Brahman and Paramatman, and then the greatest secret of all, Sarvaguyata Mambuya, Shunume Paramang Vachaha, my supreme word, my supreme teaching, is it's just three. It's just three verses, just three verses. If I had to take th three verses from the Gita and forget the rest of them, I would take eighteen sixty four through sixty six. That is the ekagra, the pinnacle, this greatest secret of all. Yes. So it's like a mountain. It's like a mountain. Forty nine verses. 14 verses, and then the tip is three verses. Beautiful. So the, so the 49 <laughs> verses are about, primarily about guna and karma, you can say? Yes. It's about analysis yes. of matter based on three modes. Yes, dharma, dharma. Mm -hmm. Okay. So once we understand the three gunas, then we will know how to perform dharma properly. Yes, dharma, karma, and so on in the first 49 verses. Um, okay. Um, uh, uh, and then, and then the, the 14 verses, the greater secret is to know transcendence and the qualities of transcendence, the true self, the Paramatman, Brahman. These are, this is the realm of transcendence. And then beyond transcendence, transcending transcendence mm. is the greatest secret of all. It's Krishna. It's just Krishna. Just Krishna. Transcending transcendence. Yeah. It says in this 49 to 50, 63, Krishna talks about himself. So you could say that, yes. that transcendence, like I think 55 to 58, he's talking mm -hmm. about himself. He also says that, Mad Bhakti Palabhate Param, you attain my transcendent yeah. devotion. Then he says that, if you become conscious of me, you'll pass over all obstacles by my grace. That's so right. You could say that this, this transcendence from 49 to uh, from 49 to 50, 63, it also includes Bhagwan in one sense. But there is not a singular focus on Bhagwan. That's right. The 64 onwards, it's a singular focus. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Well, of course, the, the poignant, the poignant thing about this is that it's Krishna's voice saying all of this. So the whole thing is focusing on Bhagavan. So, you know, Bhagavan, the irony, the irony is that the, the highest and the most intimate is explaining everything below himself, waiting for us to appreciate the greatest secret of all. And look, look what Krishna says after those three verses. One who explains this greatest secret of all to anyone is most beloved to me. Yes. So, so before this, in 1868 to 69, 68 to 68 onwards, he talks about the 68, 69. So this 67, which he says, don't share it with those who are envious, those who don't have a devotional attitude. Yes. So, so, yeah, so don't don't share it with anyone. And then he says to share it with everyone. <laughs> in a sense, it's right. <laughs> but but be discerning. That's right. Be yes. discerning. This is, the, the, yeah, please go. Ahead. You can't give, give the most precious gift. To give a, the most precious gift you have, to give it to someone who's undeserving or not appreciative, why would anyone do that? Why would you give a, 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 a big fat diamond to someone you don't even know? Yeah. So in one sense, we could say these verses are, are conveying to different moods. One is like caution and compassion. At one level, like if a, if a parent has a lot of inheritance that's meant for their children, they want to give it to everyone. But at one level, if the children are just going to squander it, neglect it, then 
it has to be given to them when they are becoming responsible or they're likely to become responsible. <laughs> that's right. So, something like that. Good. Something like that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so yeah. also this uh, idam that 1867 idam tena Don't give it to those who are uh, uh, undeserving. Krishna mentions in one sense if you consider the categories which he uses, as I said, it almost includes everyone. So those <laughs> yes. who are not austere, those who are not envious. It's it's a very broad category. That's right. And um, sometimes I try to like differentiate between like confidential guhia, that is secret and there is private. Yeah. So it's more, more in my understanding, it's more like private. Like say a husband and wife want to talk with each other and there's somebody yeah. else there. Can we have some privacy? So yeah. it's not that it is something which is deliberately meant to be hidden from everyone else. It's just that it isn't it's not relevant to everyone else. And for right. those who it's relevant, then for them it's definitely to be spoken. Yeah, so, that's right. Mm. Chaitanya Charan uh, Ji, I, I'm I'm reminded of Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswaman's quandary in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Remember, he says, "I don't know if I should disclose all this private stuff about Chaitanya. I mean, what what if someone reads this when they're not supposed to?" And then he said, ah, but guess what? I'll present it, and the people who are not supposed to understand it, they won't understand it. They won't be able to perceive it anyway. So I'll present it because it's inherently hidden from those who are simply not receptive. Mm. So I will present, so Krishna does this, I think he gets this from Krishna, because Krishna says, I'll present the supreme secret, the greatest secret of all, the supreme secret of yoga, even though most people won't even get it. But I'll present it for those who will get it. Mm. So there's, oh. like in the Bhakti Sutra, it's Bhakti is there for those who are, are, are receptive. The, the word is patra. There's a, a receptivity, you know, an openness, like a pot, right? an openness, ready to receive the contents to fill it up. Mm. But those whose pots are already full and just with other junk, they're not going to receive it. Yeah. So yeah. bhakti is there for those who really are ready to receive it. So the secretiveness, the private, the private factor, the privacy factor, is built in to the lack of receptivity or the 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 wealth of, of receptivity that someone has. So Krishnadas Kaviraj then went on to write the rest of the Chaitanya Charitamrita without inhibition. Mm. So in one sense, uh, we could say that maybe faith can be in the Gita's context or in the Bhakti context is often better translated as receptive, re being receptive rather than like being believing. Because if you see in the second chapter, in the ninth chapter also, Krishna says that those who are not, uh, uh, those who don't have faith will not, Ashadadhana Purusha, Dharma Syasya Parantapa. He says that those who are in, those who not have faith, they will not have faith, they will not understand this. They will come back to the cycle of birth and death. But several yes. times in the Bhagavad Gita, sorry, sorry in the Bhagavatam and other places, <clears throat> the Prabhupada translates Shraddha more as positive curiosity or serious inquisitiveness mm, yes in the in the divinity and divine service chapter oh, yes. Prabhupada serious inquisitiveness and yes. in the nine stages of bhakti Prabhupada in one sense he there's shraddha and there's nishtha so nishtha is more like conviction but often Prabhupada translates shraddha as almost like curiosity yeah hey what are these people doing let me let me inquire about it Yes. So, so that could also be correlated with receptivity. Yes. Nice. And of course, don't forget about chapter 17, verse 3. That the shraddha is dependent upon the degree of sattva. Mm -hmm. And sattva is, in some sense, in terms of the trigunya, is a level of receptivity. But so someone who is absorbed in a rajasa kind of existence, they'll be somewhat receptive. And someone who's absorbed in a tamasa 
type of existence, there will be very little receptivity at whatsoever. Mm. Um, and of course, it's the bhakta, it's the power of the bhakta to be able to take whatever little receptivity there may be and to grow that, expand it, open that. Okay. That's why Prabhupada said in one sense, we would quote this was from Bhagavan Aji Brahmanda Brahmite. That those who are wandering, yeah. some people become fortunate. And Prabhupada said, it's a, it's, the, it's the business of the devotees to make everyone fortunate. <laughs> yeah, very good. So take I, I like that. And expand it. Yeah, okay. that's right. Mm. That's right. Well, see, but that is the grace of Guru. See, grace of Guru is that they can, he can, he or she can take whatever little tiny spark is there and fan it. Mm. And let it, let it. I've seen people do this at campsites. They create the littlest spark. And I'm thinking, wow, are you going to make fire from that? But they're expert. They take the littlest spark and they, and suddenly I see a fire come from it. Mm. That is guru. That is bhakta. That is bhakta as guru. Yes. To take that spark and turn it into a fire. Mm. And this will also require some dakshata expertise to understand yeah. what, where exactly the spark is and how to fan it. We cannot yes. um, like, uh, just uh, uh, like upload and download approach. This is a bhakti philosophy and you take it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. There's no easy formula for this. Mm. There's no, and, and this is the power of the Guru Parampara coming through Guru. That and, and 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 ultimately, it's Krishna who knows how to fan the spark. We just become instruments. We're more like the flint, the, the flint. You know, Krishna is the one who's actually you know creating the spark, mm. you know, to, to yes. be fanned. Yes, so I'm that's why Prabhupada describes Guru as as a via medium, transparent via medium. Mm. The word transparency is the important word here. That mm. that it's not that there's something. Uh, we have to be careful not to get in the way of bhakti. This too easily happens, Chaitanya Charanji. We get in the way of what is pure, the pure power of bhakti. We may set up institutional norms that are simply a. Uh, um, filters blocking the full power of bhakti. So we may get the partial uh, power of bhakti. We may um, be stretching the guru's words. We may be, um, uh, you know, tainting the process that Prabhupada gave us and adding things to it as if it were, in, in, you know, in, inadequate. Um, uh, we may be, you know, over editing things. We may be, there are all kinds of ways that we could be blocking the pure power of bhakti. So we have to help each other. Okay. Yeah. Totally. See, I'm de see, I'm depending on you, Chaitanya Charanji. So you're my friend. I, I hope you consider me a friend. So, you know, we are friends. Sorry, and if friend. ever I say something that really seems to not let the light of bhakti come through perfectly, I depend on you to say something to me. Mm. I depend on you to correct me, to suggest how I can be more accurate in a certain way. Mm. Otherwise, so, I'm, I'm isolated. And in isolation, bhakti cannot work in this age. That's why we have not just the kirtan movement, but the sankirtan movement. Mm. We do it together and we do it perfectly. That upasarga, sum, means together and perfectly. <laughs> it has two different meanings. We come together and we do it, we, we do it perfectly. When we don't come together, we will not do it perfectly. Yes. True. So I think if I get the connection in what you're saying is that basically that awakening the spark. It is Krishna is simply using us as an instrument, and Krishna in fact tells Arjuna also that you become my instrument. Nimitta matram bhavasa Yes. So that so there is both like individual agency and divine agency, isn't it? It's we want to become an instrument. Doesn't that doesn't mean that 
we become insentient. We still That's have right. our free will. It is like a loving harmonization or uh, so our agency is there, but our agency in one sense does the divine will. Right. Yeah. So, nice. Yeah. So it's a, a Prabhupada. Well, see, he, 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 you know how, you, yeah, you know how Prabhupada says Guru is one. Mm. And and you know why he asserts that is because because gurus are also different. Yes. So I mean, look look at the difference between Prabhupada and his guru, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. There are differences. And what about the differences between Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati and Bhakti Vinod Thakur? There are differences. Don't forget about Gaur Kishore. I mean, a lot of differences there. Okay. So, I mean, there's so many differences, but these are different ways of, these are different containers of what is one. And that oneness is uh, Kripa. The Kripa. There, in the, as the Bhakti Sutra says, there is no difference between the Mahatmyas, the great souls, and divinity itself. There's no difference in one respect, the grace that's delivered. Mm. Kripa. Yeah, it's a, uh, currently the Dhamma Lila is going on, and one of the yeah. prayers that the Nalakur Manigri offer after they are liberated, they say is that, Drishti satam darshan is to bhavat tanuna. That mm. beholding yes. your devotees is non different from having your darshan. That's so right. they say that now we are going back to go to heaven, so we won't have your darshan. But we pray that we will have the uh, darshan of your devotees. So, so yes. they, they say that same container. So there's an explicit verse about this in the Bhakti Sutras. Yes. Mm. Yes. You know, maybe we could do a in future a podcast on the Bhakti Sutras and their significance because that's not a very prominently referred to book within within our movement. And when yes. I read it, it is like I felt that hey, what have we what have we been doing for so many years? Why did I read this before? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You you know what's interesting, uh, Jaitanya Chandraji is is uh, that I read a translation of the Bhakti Sutra when I was 14 years old. And oh. that's what attracted me to Bhakti. Mm. So that was the original book that I read. 14, okay. Yes, when I was 14 years old. And that's what caused me to read the Gita at 15. And that's what caused me to drop out of high school at 15. There were my very educated parents, very educated, very, very good parents I have. So one day I go up to them and I say, I think I want to drop out of high school. And they said, well, said, what will you do all day? I said, I will read Gita and meditate. They said, all day you will read Gita and you will meditate? I said, yes. They said, okay. They said, well, what about college? I said, if college is supposed to happen, it will happen. And boy, did that happen. I have not been able to leave college. <laughs> <laughs> this is also an example what you said earlier of the Bhakti Yoga including everything in itself. So, yes. So indeed. This is Bhakti Yoga includes Virat Rupa, so we can say Bhakti Yoga includes academia also. Yes. Somehow it even includes academia. Yeah. I mean, as yeah. unlikely as unlikely as that is, yes, it can include academia. Uh, but um, yeah, amazing. Um, you know, the, the ways that Krishna's, you know, Krishna's Kripa comes to us, there's no limit. You know, I see the Gita as speaking about three levels no matter what it's talking about. It's preparatory. There's preparatory bhakti. That can be karma yoga. Preparatory bhakti, practical bhakti, and perfective bhakti. The three Ps. 
You mentioned preparatory, this yeah, preparatory bhakti is any, there is no limit to how someone will come to Krishna. Look at all the stories, how I came to Krishna consciousness. You know how many stories there are? Is there one that duplicates another? No. Radhana Swami and I have something parallel. I went to India and he ran into all of these famous people. And so I ran into no one famous, but I went to Vrindavan unknowingly on Janmashtami Eve. I landed. In, similarity. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I landed in Vrindavan on Janmashtami Eve. I did not know it was Janmashtami. I did not even know the term Janmashtami, but I was hankering to be in Krishna's place, which I knew was Vrindavan. And I, but before that, for weeks, I was with friends, five other friends. I was only 18 years old. I was with five other friends, and they were into stuff that I just, I just found so tedious and just was not, there was no discussion about Krishna and the Gita. They were in other sort of, say, visiting other sages and celebrating other things. So I left them, and I went off to Krishna's holy place without knowing it was the, the eve of, of Janmashtami. Mm. So that was my first experience of Vrindavan. It wasn't with the devotees. It was on my own. Krishna brought me to Vrindavan somehow. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. So, so that's preparatory. That's preparatory bhakti. Then I found Prabhupada. Then there's practical bhakti. Okay. And then, Chaitanya Charanji, I'm looking forward to perfective bhakti. Mm. Looking forward. So, preparatory bhakti, you could say it's more like the first two stages of Shraddha, Sadhu, Sangha. There's some kind of, some kind of curiosity is created. Some kind of association is made available some way. So, yes. then practical bhakti would be starting from Bhajana Kriya, I presume. Yes. Well, you know the word, okay, first, you know, Ado Shraddha, okay, we just, mm. we're talking about the word Shraddha. Now, the word Shraddha, the morphology of the word, is where one places, where one's heart is placed. Heart, Shraddha, placed. Now, what's interesting is that, in one sense, we place our hearts into different things, right? Mm. But, but Krishna is also in our hearts. So sometimes Krishna is placing our hearts and we're not placing our hearts. So who, who knows who's placing whose hearts, okay? So Shraddha can have all kinds of implications. Shraddha, suddenly Krishna placed my heart in Vrindavan. And that was preparatory bhakti. I've heard of devotees coming to Krishna consciousness through drugs, they were, they were taking drugs and they experienced altered states of consciousness, realizing that there was a, a different way of understanding the world. The world isn't necessarily the way we perceive it normally. That can be altered. And then coming in touch with devotees or somehow becoming aware of Krishna Bhakti, realized that this is the ultimate uh, altered state of consciousness. So they... So even though drugs are artificial and they're frankly unhealthy and dangerous, even that can be something that brings us to Krishna Bhakti. Look at Arjuna, for heaven's sake, Chaitanya Charanji. Mm. Look at Arjuna. Krishna was right in front of him, mm. and he was worried about the war. That was preparatory Bhakti for Arjuna. That despondency that Arjuna Vashada Yoga, that Vashada, right? Arjuna Vashada, that hopelessness, that state of depression and hopelessness is what brought him to Krishna's lotus feet. Mm. For some people, it brings them to the sanatorium. <laughs> okay, yeah. For some people, it brings them to Prozac. That's true. For Arjuna, it brought him to Krishna's lotus feet. That's called a Vishada Yoga, 
the yoga of hopelessness. That's preparatory bhakti. What I would call preparatory bhakti. Mm -hmm. So we could almost say that that this this progression in Arjuna's relationship with Krishna that happens in the Bhagavad Gita, because that can also mirror how the soul progresses towards Krishna in some ways. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, and that's what differentiates the Bhagavad Gita from other scriptures. It takes the soul from the most troubled state to the perfective state, all the way. The reader witnesses Arjuna at the most horrific state mm. to the most blessed state. And yeah, and the Gita's wisdom can guide us on a similar journey ourselves. That's, and, that's it. Yeah, and so, so, so when you we talk early, so the specific, specific four relationship that Arjuna has with Krishna, chariot, uh, charioteer, confident, then teacher and divinity. We may not necessarily go through those that progression, but some way yes. or the other, in our journey of preparatory bhakti, we will come to divinity. Yes, and, Krishna is already on everyone's chariot. Mm. He's already dry. He's already on everyone's chariot. We know this, but do we know? But do we take it for granted? Yes, as conditioned souls, we take it for granted, and then Arjuna experiences the shattered heart. A shattered heart. Sometimes a shattered heart can open the heart. And what do we find in the heart? A teacher, the voice of the teacher, the real teacher, the ultimate teacher. And that teacher can lift us up. The Chaitya Guru, the Chaitya Guru. Then he realized the Krishna Guru. So then he realized Guru is right in front of him, the Bhagavan, Bhagavan Guru. Hmm. Bhagavad Guru, you know. That's true. Call it Bhagavad Guru, call it Bhagavad Gita. Okay. I mean, Krishna was 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 longing and yearning. That's what Gita means, a, a song of yearning. A love song. He was yearning for Arjuna's heart. Yeah. But we don't hear it. We don't hear the sound of Krishna's flute. Yes. We don't hear that. It's playing all the time. He is calling us all the time. Mm -hmm. What is happening on the altar of every single temple? He is playing the flute with Radha by his side. Beautiful. So, you know, connecting that Krishna calling all souls, we could say that when we are meeting people, every soul is being called toward Krishna. But exactly how they are being called, exactly what spark is being ignited, or uh, yes. in what way their heart is being opened through shattering or whatever, that is, we need to be, we could say, sensitized enough, connected with Krishna, connected with them to find out. Yes. And then we will be able to help them. Like the earlier That's example right. you gave of, of drugs, it's a dramatic example that you could say yeah, drugs is just a person going into Tamoguna. But in other ways, right. like, okay, it is. But if it is giving us a sense that, yeah, maybe there's more to reality than what I experience every day. Right. That that is the opening. That so, that's the preparatory. There's mm -hmm. no there's no formula for preparatory. People come to Krishna Bhakti in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. There's no formula for it. Mm -hmm. And that is why maybe you can say that in Krishna says in three twenty six then. Don't disturb the minds of people, but engage them from where they are. That's so right. what he means is that they they are at a particular level and we could see a hundred things that they are doing wrong. Like we can say this person is doing drugs and that's wrong. That's right. But we instead of just condemning them for what they are doing, we look at, okay, where is this opening something towards that's Krishna it. for them? Where is that spark? Where is... Uh, once we start looking Beautiful. that way, think uh, we also become less judgmental and more more 
approachable, more compassionate. Yes, very much sensitive. To be sensitive to the thoughts and feelings of others is exactly what we as bhaktas should be doing. This is the whole point, is to, is to appreciate exactly what you said, Chaitanya Charanji, that where's the opening? Where can I elevate this soul? That's the key thing. And you know, Krishna is very, very, um, he's very respectful of all kinds of preparatory bhakti. Those who worship the, you know, the, 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 uh, the divinities, they can worship, they go to the divinities, those who worship the pratas, the buddhas, the shachas, they, you know, I mean, I understand that people worship different things, Krishna says, but those who worship me, ah, they come to me. Mm. And you know what? You can take out your kusha grass mat. You can take that kusha grass, you can sit on that mat, you can do your breathing, you can offer the one breath, the, 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 the outgoing breath into the ingoing breath. The ingoing. That's great. You can do that. No problem. But one who offers his self or herself to me, this is the highest. Yoginam api sarvesham madgatinam taratmana shadhavan bhajate yoma. It's, it's right there. Bajate yo, mom. Right, it's right there. One who loves me, this is perfect. That yogi comes to me. Mm. Beautiful. See, Krishna's incredibly patient and permissive. There are those that practice the Vedic rituals. Fine. There are those that 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 uh, uh, that uh, uh, um, relinquish the fruits of their actions. Great, fine karma, you karma, you know karmi mamansa, you know. But those who offer their the fruits of their actions to me, mm, okay, we're getting somewhere. There are the yogis. Hey, though the yogis that uh, die during the waxy moon, not the waning moon. Hey. Make sure you don't die during the waning moon, only the waxing moon. Do we buckets care? <laughs> we don't care about that. Yeah. We don't care about that. But he says, look, there are people that care about that. The yeah. bhakta only cares about serving Krishna. It's interesting that even Krishna himself says, don't care about that too much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yogi yeah, yeah. yogi says, so what you're saying is that in one sense, Krishna is not condemning anything, but he is definitely recommending something. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. There we go. Yeah. I like how you said that. Don't care about that too much. I like that way you put yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> don't be too. Don't be too much. You know, uh, over overly invested in that. Not so good. Not so good. Mm. Yeah, so, so, so in one sense, when Krishna is talking about all those processes, he is overviewing them at one level for Arjuna, and the, and the, through that contrast, he is um, he's. He's subtly pointing out, and this is the best. So it's yes. uh, so it's uh, it's uh, it's not like a like we you talk about categorical. This is wrong and this is right. Rather, you know, okay, this is what this is. This is what this is. Now, this is what makes more sense. This is what is more accessible. Right. Mm. See, it's the difference. If if I can, if I can wax grammatically here, mm. it's the difference between an intransitive verb and a transitive verb. An okay. intransitive. An intransitive verb doesn't take an object. It stops with what you're doing. Whereas a transitive verb transits to an object and ultimately, ideally, the divine object. So every activity, every subject should transit to the divine object. That's so we want, we want transitive verbs that go to the divine object. Uh, okay, that is you are extending the domain of, domain of Krishna consciousness into English grammar now. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. The int the intransitiveness 
is the problem. Mm. I'm working every day. I'm working hard every day at my job. But it doesn't transit to anything. Mm. It's intransitive. We have to turn the intransitive into a transitive. Mm. And that object ideally is a divine object. Yeah. Sometimes it's transitive to money. I work all, I, the subject, work hard all day, that's the verb, for money. That's the object. Well, you see, that's, you know, that's fine. I mean, that's, but what's money? It's energy. What's energy? Ultimately, it's Krishna's energy. Every object is ultimately Krishna, but people don't know it. Mm. Yeah. See, every, uh, every transitive object is ultimately divine, but they don't know it. They don't see how it fits into the supreme object. Every object fits into the supreme object. So this is what bhakti is about. Bhakti is about our hearts being offered to the divine. That There's the, the subject, the transitive verb, and the object, the divine object. Then that is perfection. That's the perfection of grammar. This is okay. Jiva Goswami using Harinamamur Vyakrat. He is using Sanskrit grammar to talk about Lord Hari. This is beautiful. I was thinking that when you said that, uh, like we talk about money, you know, making money is important, but then what we are making with money is even more important. That's so right. Ultimately, if you're using money in Krishna's service, and uh, so the even when Krishna talks about the worship of the devtas, so it's it's more like the intransitiveness that is the problem, because yeah. in the Mahabharata, even Arjuna is worshiping the devtas. Arjuna worships Shiva and Indra to get weapons, and the gopis worship Katyayani. But for them, that worship is a means to Krishna. There we go. Then that's transitive. That's transitive. Yes. Yes, sir. It's when it's intransitive when we stop there. We stop there, that's a problem. And then the, there's another problem when we stop there and it becomes a verb that indicates for self-benefit rather than the benefit of the object. So in Sanskrit, we've got atmanepada and parasmaipada verbs. They make a distinction between those actions that benefit the subject and those object, those actions that benefit the object. Paras, para, the other, right? Parasmaipada. So actions that benefit another, that's transitive. Atmanepada is actions that benefit me. The problem is Atmanepada, we're trying to get away from an essentially egocentric world to a, a, a supreme object world. Mm. We're trying to transfer from Ahankara to Anyakara. I think I've used that before here. Yes. With you. The anyakara, the, but then the paramanyakara, the supreme other. That's the beloved object. Ahankara is atmanepada. I'm, I'm acting, I, subject, am acting for whom? Me. Hmm. When the object is me, it's not transiting anywhere. It's just coming right back around to me. Hmm. It's a boomerang. True. Boomerang is a good example. It, in many ways, <laughs> you know, when we we focus too much on ourselves, all our energies actually come back to hit and hurt us only. The boomerang hits that, back. That's, that, that's the boomerang. Exactly. Uh, so people who are too fixated on their own problems, often their that's own right. thinking makes their problems worse. That's they right. Their mental energy is boomeranging on them. That's a powerful example. That's right. That's right. So Arjuna's troubles, his mm. shattered heart, was transiting him to Krishna's lotus feet. And had he stayed in his shattered heart, his troubled ways, his state of hopelessness, when he literally sat collapsed in his chariot, you know, chapter 1, verse 47, he just dropped his bow, he collapsed into his chariot. If it, the Gita could have ended there. 
that would be Atmanepada Gita. Mm. But the Parasmaipada Gita, it went on because it transited into the second chapter. Atmanepada Gita would be only 47 verses. But the but the Parasmaipada Gita is 700 mm. verses. So we could even say that uh, that when people when we are interacting with people that in whatever way their consciousness is coming out of themselves and say if somebody is a humanitarian worker somebody is an environmentalist somebody is an animal rights animal rights activist even somebody is a nationalist so we can say that at, to those degrees their consciousness has become parasmipada yeah. And now we can appreciate that and see how it can be taken forward. Prabhupada talks about yes. the Ikshya Upanishad, that you know, all isms can be dotailed in Krishna's service. That's right. So it's only when then the consciousness gets stuck over there. Like environmental right. consciousness is so important. But sometimes we can even have environmental fanaticism where you know, people just... There is this whole trend that sometimes people start hating humanity. In the name of yes. loving the environment, we start hating humanity, that humanity is causing mm -hmm. such a problem to the environment. So, so that we appreciate where it's expanding and we take it forward. Yes. So, yes. Yeah, so, and uh, see, Arjuna, Arjuna is standing in for all of us. Mm -hmm. There is existentially a very sort of tragic sense of life. The whole idea of cultivating so many dear relationships and being setting up in this world and then uh, a kind of forced eviction um, against one's will. One's natural will is to live forever because mm. that's the nature of the soul. But that is misplaced with the limitations of the body and identification with the body. So, as we know, Arjuna is standing in for the rest of us. This is why it's so important to read the Gita over and over and over and over again. Every person will discover new messages for them personally. Mm. This is the power of the Gita. It's, it's the power of the Gita. I tell, you know, a, a devotee students of mine, I said, read the Gita over and over, but find, but when you, when, a, when you come across a verse that just hits you, just speaks to you, write that verse down and carry it with you everywhere and repeat it all the time. Mm. This is, we can say, we're almost like developing our personal relationship with the Gita. Yes, but it's a way. Yes, it, it, and what is that personal relationship? The nature of that relationship is we are entering into a dialogue that is actually speaking to us. And, and, and by finding a verse that's so beautiful for you, you know, so one who sees me everywhere and sees all things in me to such a person, I am never lost, nor is such a person ever lost to me. How loving is that? I mean, per, I mean that's one of my, well, I have a hundred favorite verses. I'm not very discriminating. But anyway, but, but how loving is that, Chaitanya Charanji? I mean, you know, you know, one who sees me everywhere and sees all things in me, to such a person I am never lost, nor is such a person ever lost to me. Wow. <laughs> you know, and of course, Krishna says in the seventh chapter, 19th verse, Vasudeva Sarvam. Vasudeva Sarvam. Even that phrase. I go around the house to trade. Vasudeva Sarvam. <laughs> Krishna is my everything. 
He is my all. Mm -hmm. Vasudeva is my all. Take the Gita and speak it. Speak it as your own. You think the Gita belongs to Arjuna? Belongs to all of us. Anyone who will listen, anyone who will enter into its beautiful messages. So the Gita needs to be activated within us. As Prabhupada describes in the, I think, the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, how Maharaj Pariksit drank the nectar of the Bhagavatam through the ears. That shows that reading is not a passive process. If it were drinking were passive, you know what would happen? If I do this, the water would just drip all over my face. You have to take it in, you swish it around, and you swallow it. That's what we have to do with the verses. So drink the words from the Gita, which speaks to us, we can cherish it. And you said about 100 favorite verses. I'd love to hear which of those are for you. <laughs> Sometime we can discuss that. Oh, yes. So, yes. Yeah. Our our greatest hits, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, too. So this has been a wonderful discussion. You can say yeah. we, uh, we took one thread of our original topic and went profoundly deep into that. Should I yeah. try to summarize, Prabhu? Uh, yes, please. Go ahead. I, I would be delighted to hear. Yeah, so in discussing how the Gita is different from other sacred texts, we, that was our original topic, but what we focused on is the theme of uh, multiple levels of, of relationships in the Gita. So whereas in the say the Socratic dialogues, it's more of a, the dialogue the law itself is profound, but the relationship is fairly flat, teacher and student. Yeah. Whereas in the Gita, we have the relationship evolving from Arjuna sees Krishna as a charioteer, then a confidant, then a teacher, and then as divinity. And within divinity itself, there are multiple layers. There's divinity, uh, divinity everywhere that is all around us. That is, you are true for divinity without like permeating all of reality is Brahman, divinity within us, Paramatma, and divinity uh, in front of us, that is Bhagwan. Yes. So in one sense, uh, Krishna is right in front of Arjuna, but Arjuna has to go through this evolution, evolutionary process to realize that this is Bhagwan. And in the Gita, we, uh, Krishna, as he is uh, discussing, we, we discuss the whole concept of Rasa, Aishwarya and Madhurya, that we cannot really restrict love to rigid categories. It's yes. more flexible and fluid. So shring, so we could use Madhurya is there in all the rasas. And the, so rather than thinking of Arjuna's relationship only as Sakya rasa, it is Sakya, but it is it is also multi-flavored. Yes. And it differentiates between Sakya, Madhurya and Aishwarya. Aish, sorry, and, no, and Shringar. Shringar is more of conjugal. So yes. when we when there is the flow of love, the, the whole idea is yoga means it is Krishna embracing us and as we approach him as he embraces him he embraces us back yes and the various conceptions of divinity which are described in the gita at one level they are we can say we can put them in categories like say the Brahm, the virat rupa is for karma yoga and then the you can say brahman is for gyan yoga paramatma is for dhyan yoga bhagwan is for bhakti yoga but another level it's integrated you know, a devotee can also Meditate on the Virat Rupa, but it is more perceiving Krishna in his absence, like the gopis. They talk with various natural objects in the forest of Rindavan. So Bhakti yes. is inclusive. And yes. every aspect, like even academia can be included, even, <laughs> even what can open people to Krishna, even like drugs can open people to Krishna because it just opens their worldview to some that there's something more to the world than what I view. Mm -hmm. And uh, then this integration is not just because we could say Krishna is pervades all in all of existence, but we are also integrated beings. We are not just the four terms, like interactive, which is more related to the action, then 
cognitive that is more related with jnana then there is affective related with bhakti and there is contemplative you can add it as related to dhyana so all these faculties are there for us so yes. maybe in particular path a particular faculty is more emphasized but bhakti integrates all the faculties and uses them yes and then uh, talked about the the whole that this this transitive and transitive was, was one of the most brilliant points that that <laughs> it says the words they had to go to some object so like everything the gita envisions is meant to transit us to krishna so we pursue the world we work to earn money we do our own work our do our jobs mm, even somebody worships the devatas if it is all transiting towards krishna then that is the perfection so there is this preparatory bhakti there is practicing practicing bhakti and then there is perfected bhakti so right. preparatory bhakti there are unlimited ways because every story of how i came to krishna consciousness is unique and then so when we are trying to do outreach and we need to see you know, where is that spark that can be found where is the opening in somebody's heart so yes. how is that person's consciousness going beyond themselves sometimes yes. it could be that their, their heart is shattered but through the shattering of the heart it's opening and then yes. they're connecting with the voice of the divine within so that that krishna is the ultimate guru and every guru is like a via medium yeah. and to the extent we remain transparent to that extent we will able to, be able to connect krishna or krishna the krishna connection will flow through us to others and that means both you know, we need to connect with krishna internally but we also need to connect with others we need to be sensitive rather than being judgmental think what people are doing wrong we focus on okay how is krishna prompting them over here where mm-hmm. is there the opening of their consciousness there is this curiosity coming so that atmani pada and parasmai pada that where where there is um, so shraddha atmani pada means the self centered or ego centered i think i like the word ego centered more than self centered because in one sense this, we are always centered on the self the yeah. self is a part of krishna always but ego centered to the anya pa- Uh, to ahankar to anyakar to para paramanyakar is paranyakar <laughs> right. yeah right. so like that that journey is what we ourselves are trying to go on and we are trying to help others go on that journey so the gita is gita in one sense depicts the journey of arjuna but arjuna stands for each one of us and depicts our journey also just as arjuna went from being shattered in the world to being uh, being connected with krishna absorbed in krishna that the ekagrata the 64 65 66 verses the highest secret which is both uh, to be dealt with with caution at the same time to be shared with compassion that that journey can happen for all of us yes. and for that journey to happen you know we can prompt it by for others by seeing where their heart is opening for ourselves You know, if we are reading the gita and we find one verse that speaks to us then we relish that cherish that keep it with us write it down and then meditate on it come back to it and see that this is krishna calling us through that verse yes so basically we could say the bhagavad gita is krishna's love call the longing the call of his the poem that expresses the longing of his heart yes. so we have to find out you know where we can hear that call and where others are hearing that call beautiful respond mm. so that is the that is the active way of reading the gita and not the passive way yes yes true. beautiful so many points this is such a beautiful illuminating from podcast thank you yes. so much but let me add one thing yeah please you said earlier correctly that as we embrace krishna krishna will embrace us back but what we need to understand is that krishna's already embracing us mm. without within everywhere around us but he wants more mm. he wants us to return the embrace as bhagavan right in front of us mm. he's yeah. already embracing us he's already carrying us he's already supporting us he's already giving us so many blessings when will we appreciate that when will we feel the embrace of krishna and then 
yoga really is the return embrace. That's really the definition of yoga. Yoga, div, divinity has his yoga. Without, within, and everywhere around us. Without, within, everywhere around us. But in front of us, he wants to be seen. He wants to be known. He wants us to be close to him. Throughout the whole Gita, there are so many, you know, uh, uh, ways he expresses this. Um, so the return embrace is what we're all about. Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's like whatever we are conscious of is also Krishna, but we are not conscious it is Krishna. Like that, <laughs> Krishna is embracing us already, but we, we need to return that embrace. Beautiful. That's right. We, and we so. can do that when we know Krishna from without, from within, and all around us. Mm. Then we can do that. Yes. Thank you so much. This is a wonderful discussion, Ru. Hare Krishna. Thank Look you. forward to having you for the podcast in the future. Yeah, very good. I would love it. Thank you so much, Chaitanya. Thank you, Ru.